You're listening to the Scars and Guitars podcast series that syndicates for the A-List Online, and my name is Andrew Mackay-Smith. Hope you're well. The interview subject that I have coming up for you is Cameron McKenzie from the Melbourne-based outfit Horsehead. Now, the reason for the chat with Cameron is to promote Horsehead's box set. There's two of them, actually. There's one called the Horsehead Legacy box set, and the other one, the Horsehead Legacy Super Fan box set. You should see what's in the Super Fan box set. I'll read out some of the stuff. There's a uh, there's coloured vinyl that's in there. There's a tote bag. There's a woven patch. There's a custom made legacy vinyl protector box. How many other bands go to that effort, or record companies go to that effort? So if you want to find out more about both releases, do go to the band's socials. You'll find them fairly easily when you type in Horsehead into Facebook, and also Golden Robot Records, which is what 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 Golden Robot Records dot com. So for now, here he is, Cam from the band. Horsehead. Andy, it's Cameron. How are you? It is, mate. That was quick. How's things? Yes, good. Just uh, enjoying sunny Melbourne, not. Oh yeah, God. Yeah, is it? What is it? What's the weather like down there today, mate? Is it? Is it as bloody hot as it is oh. here? Or have you got rain? No, it's it's been. We've got this stream of cold air that's going across Victoria, and it's been like that for this whole time. Like you guys have been sweltering, and we're just like twenty degrees, nineteen degrees. You know. Geez, we're a funny continent, are we? We're such a big country oh. that. That like I mean we had bushfires down the road from us not not I mean I could walk to it you know it was that close just last night oh, and, yeah. and we're just oh, where are you? Yeah. northern Gold Coast is where I'm at oh Gold Coast far out you know so content yeah oh, it's beautiful mate but I'm just I, you know I don't think we've had a morning for it's certainly been a month but it's certainly been longer than that we haven't woken up to the uh, Acrid smell of bushfire smoke. So, man, I just thank God for these bloody rural fire services and the work that they do, and the oh, regular fireys, mate. You know, they're just champions, these oh, fellas. Oh, they are. They deserve absolute medals. Incredible stuff. Yeah, I was actually watching something on those awful Black Saturday fires. That's an understatement, calling them awful. But, you know, there's Black Saturday yeah. fires down there, mate, in, in, in Victoria, how close they got to Melbourne. And, and there's a couple of things that I learned about bushfires by watching that. And... The last thing you've got to worry about is getting burnt effectively. It's the it's the uh, lack of oxygen and the radiated heat, if you like, from three hundred right. meters away, mate. Jesus, you know. I know, I know. I had I had some friends who um <clears throat> who were in King Lake, and um yeah, yeah there was talk. There was, there was yeah, the tree line stopped a hundred meters away, and the water tank exploded. Yep, and I I heard that over and over again from people. Actually, exactly to that mm. point, and it was that's where people actually suffered the most, I think, because they thought they were safe and they bloody weren't safe, you know. Yeah. And, but but there's no no precedent for it. We hadn't had bushfires on record as that ferocious ever. No, you know, I know. But it is uh, it is what it is, mate. But look. Uh, Let's talk about the music, shall we? <laughs> Let's uh... talk about the music. Because <laughs> I remember you guys. You know, I'm 41, and I was I was pretty young back in the 90s. Um, but You're uh, young. well, you know what I mean. I, I couldn't go to gigs, is what yeah. I was saying. I couldn't actually go to uh, right. pub gigs, is what I mean by that. So, but I remember yeah. remembered seeing your posters up around town. I certainly remember buying Hot Metal magazine. And seeing yep. the ads for for Horsehead in there, and and when I did eventually get to listen to the music uh, back then, and I've, I've been able to reconnect with you guys because of what you're doing here with Golden Robot Records. But you know, I always thought you were Australia's answer to you know Led Zeppelin, The Cult. You had Warrior Soul, Jane's Addiction. That's the school that I remember Horsehead was a part of back in the day. So, and and it, uh, you've got a solid following. That much is obvious because you're able to do this one here. But, mate, how has reception and interest been in this this wonderful box set that you put together been? Um, it it has been um, it has been good. It has been probably uh, better than we expected. Um, uh, but we kind of got an inkling that it was going to be it was going to be well received. You know, within the last few months. But um, you know. <laughs> 20 years have gone by, uh, we, you sort of forget so many things hmm. um, about, about uh, the nature of your impact, <laughs> Yeah, yep. for, want of, for want of a better way of putting it. Um, <clears throat> and then as the years go by, people sort of say, oh, you know, why don't the horse get back together? And you sort of go, yeah, yeah, nice idea, but no. Um, <laughs> We didn't sell huge amounts of records. We didn't tour on our own much around the country. We did a lot of support gigs. 
Um, so we sort of left, <coughs> excuse me, wondering how much impact we were. We were. But as, as as the years roll on, people just keep kind of saying, you know, you know, favourite band type talk, and people were um, uh, really, really devoted to what we'd done. And um, mm-hmm. <coughs> here we are now, and with the help of a bit of um, history and a bit of time, uh, there's people seem to be extremely interested in in uh, revisiting it. Um, so it's kind of nice. It's nice to know, isn't it, that music from from that era still has an impact. And I think your your timing couldn't be better because I think my album of the year this year by far is by a band called Black Income from uh, Denmark who play music very similar to what you guys were doing back oh, then. Oh, really? Yeah, and it's, I mean, there's, I, it, without all of the pressure of the commercial obligations that labels put on bands to produce music in a certain style and stuff, it's organically occurring. Now on the internet really makes that possible, and I'm just there's there's yeah uh, what's this Verticoli? There's a band from uh, Tasmania that does some stuff similar to you guys too, and I, I don't know how. What are they called? In- inverted. Oh, Verticoli. So starts with V. Yeah, Verticoli. Yeah, they're a good band actually. Yeah, check them out. And I know there's others out there, but they're just the bands that come top of mind at the moment that are probably producing some of the best stuff, if you like. So yeah. I think, you know, and I, and I know you've got this one show coming up, so I, you've probably been asked this a million bloody times, but you got you got plans beyond the single show? Not at the moment. Um, and I think, uh, yeah, I mean, we always, I remember when we first started out, we, we, we said to ourselves, let's make every show an event. And... Um, and uh, <laughs> we're sticking to that philosophy, yep. uh, mm-hmm. you know. Just just want to just want to make it so as that show is going to be the show mm-hmm. for people who want to see us. Um, I'm ob- obviously, we can only do one show in one place. Um, uh, if we go, sorry, if we're going to do one show, it's only going to be in one place. So a lot mm-hmm. of people are actually travelling to come to it. Yeah. There's talk of people saying, "Would you do other shows and whatnot?" But I. <laughs> It's possible. It's possible we'll do maybe, you know, one in Sydney, but all the numbers have to line up. Um, and, you know, as I say, it's not like we can guarantee a huge crowd. And and a, and a lot of these sorts of, um, I mean, you talk about this, this kind of music as being timely. Um, I'm really interested in that because I personally haven't been following the genre. Mm. And I'm, Fascinated by you know the bands that you've just mentioned. I'll go and check them out. Um, sure, but yeah. we're not really we're not really in a position to go sort of searching for our audience because we're we're all old. We've all got our lives. Um, you know, money priorities change. When you're young, you can go around the country and go searching for your destiny and live on next to nothing, and you're fine with that. But um, when you get a bit older, we're all on. Uh, who's the youngest guy in the band, Scotty? He's like 52 or something. Um, so it's just, a, you know, you've got you've got obligations and you've got lives and incomes and, and blah, blah, blah. It's just a completely different headspace to be in. Hmm. So we, yeah, we, we would probably, we, we may well do another gig or so, but it, that's just, you know, if it, <laughs> if it looks relatively easy for us to do it, we'll do it. We're yeah. not going to go getting in a 12-seater van and trundling up through Albury to go and do a show in Sydney, you know. Oh, God. Could you imagine? I mean, I'm, I'm 41, but I don't think I could imagine anything worse personally. You know, like, apart from the show itself, but the travelling in between is just brutal, isn't it? I, I talk to people from all over the world. I was just talking to Trevor from Obituary this morning, and those guys are road yeah. dogs, mate, and uh, they're on the bus all the time. And effectively what they are is professional travellers. And yes. to really make an impact and to... Um, be able to keep yourself front and centre and top of mind of people's consciousness, you really have to be out there doing it. So I can completely understand, and I really agree with the strategy too, by the way. Not that I've got any skin in the game, but I like your idea there from the perspective that you put on one show and you make it an event, and then people can travel, man. People can travel from anywhere. Jesus, planes have been around for 70 years or whatever it's been, so we just get on the plane and travel. That's exactly right. You know? And then, uh, and it's, um, it's, it's just as easy for them to come here as it, us for, as, as it is for us to go to them. And um, but yeah, I mean, what you're saying is right. And in Australia, it's even harder again. Mm. Um, you know, there, I think in Europe and America, uh, bands can conceivably um, do a bit more touring at a lower level. Yeah. And because there's there's so many more towns, 
and um, you know the numbers can stack up, and they, those buses are all decked out. Uh, you know, people live on them, and, and oh yeah, they're uh, hotels. You know, they're yeah, yeah, absolutely. They're hotels. It's fantastic. We just don't have them here. The, the, the mileage is too big. Yeah, and uh, the population's yeah. too small. Yeah. Yeah, it's so true, isn't it? I try to, I, as I say, because I do so many of these interviews, I just occasionally we get onto this subject about why a lot of bands don't come from Australia that then go and make it overseas. And I say, well, look, we've had our eras, Jesus, and we've had In Excess and ACDC, Midnight Oil, some really silver chairs, some great stuff that's gone over there and conquered the US and Europe. But we simply do not have the population for a band outside of that pub rock era where, where there was a pub on every corner or thereabouts in Sydney and Melbourne and maybe not so much Brisbane because it was a Joe Bielke Peterson era, but but Sydney yeah. and Melbourne, you could play seven or eight venues very easily, very quickly, and you'd get a decent draw. I mean, you guys probably remember the very tail end of that era. Remember, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, I, I can only read about it, man, because it's not even after about 1994, I think it was dead. Correct me if I'm, I'm wrong. And I know that was smack bang in the middle of yours, but I think you were the last great, Oh, what I what I refer to, and feel free to disagree with me, pub rock band, Oz pub rock band, in the spirit of Lime Spiders and that sort of stuff, Radio Birdman, you know where I'm coming from, that really had an impact <laughs> and could, could do that. But otherwise, man, man, but bands from about 1996 and 1997 onwards, I mean, where the hell were you going to play? You know, um, there wasn't... Yeah. The... And yeah, and if you didn't have, like, the band, there were bands there that were successful, but they were successful because of radio and they weren't... And, you know, if you didn't have that, it was it was not going to yeah. be worse. You're talking about an era when bands could have have success live without necessarily having exactly. huge radio support. Yeah. Yeah, and yeah. Ra- radio doesn't... Ra- we were a funny, we were a funny market, cause it, and correct me if I'm wrong again, but my perception of it is radio didn't equal success. Now, what made success... Yes. Yeah, in Australia, was playing live and getting out there to the people and putting on a like the Radiators still going, for example. All these bands, Ice House Man, are still probably they're probably playing to bigger crowds now with Ivor and Ice House than they ever have, you know. And, and most definitely, yeah. And it's all because of that reputation build up of being able to do it in front of people live, you know. Sure, the radio play came along, but I don't think it was essential to success. You know, and in this yeah. country, and I, and I think I, I hear bands talk about that even fucking now, man. If you can believe it, we need to get on four triple Z or whatever the was it three triple R down there or whatever. It's like, do you know how many people listen to these stations? Bugger all. Yeah. <laughs> I've, I'm, I'm at yeah. uni. I know how many people listen to these. These you can't get a lot of hard data, but you can get a lot of data that suggests how many people listen to community radio. And forget about yeah. bloody triple J. That's gone. And triple M. Yeah. Put heart, put proper rock and roll on only between the fifty thousandth bloody overstatement of the year, but the fifty thousandth bloody yeah. Bruce Springsteen and Billy Joel song that they put on. So yep. it still means it, the internet sure is there these days. But look, you, you've you've got to really be savvy with the social media side of things if you're a band coming through. Um, so I'm going a bit off track, but you know what I'm saying, man. I mean, I think it's for, from you guys' perspective. You know that 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 era that you came in through. I'm really sad I missed it in some respects because uh, you know I would have loved to have seen you guys. I remember Judge Dread and Andy Chichon's band. Um, yeah, you guys just nailing it to the bloody wall back in sort of 1992, 1993. Um, yep. And what what can you can you explain to people who weren't there what that era was like for a band? <laughs> well, it was just that was where the vibe was. You know, like you, you, people would go out and they'd go, what, what acts are we going to go and see? And people were excited. They were excited by what was being delivered live and, and, and bands responded to that excitement. Um, it wasn't very cerebral. If, uh, and what I mean by that is it was, it was instinctual. It was powerful. Um, it wasn't asked. It wasn't supposed to be um, too too thought about. Although of course it was pretty cerebral. I think about it, <laughs> but um, you know, um, yeah, it was just in the ether. The 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 appreciation of good rock music, and um, yeah, as you say, we were sort of at the end, at the very tail end of the real heyday. In mm. Sydney and Melbourne, you know, Sydney, you know, had you know bands in every pub on every corner, and that's just what people did. Um, that was that's what they did. They mm. went out and they drank and they. Um, but yeah, the world changes, and it's it's impossible to put it. It's impossible to pinpoint 
even a whole host of reasons. It's just it's just we've changed, mm. and uh, the only thing that I can um, that I keep turning back to in my mind is that the world sort of loses interest in things as time goes on, and that's right. That's that's the way it should be, and you get these heydays of certain forms of social activity or art, um, and you know. Um, and the creators of that art, uh, they hit, they they are like on such a high, mm-hmm. and then and uh, you know even everything from impressionist painting to you know to classical baroque music, whenever the period is, let's pick any period. There's going to be a period where the where the people are absolutely creating the greatest thing, and then it just sort of okay, that's sort of done, and it dies away, and something else replaces it. Mm. And um, I think I think pop music, rock music, sort of has has done that. If you look at the arc of it over the last eighty years, mm-hmm. you can see the arc. And Oz Oz rock music has its place in that arc, and uh, it's not at the top of the arc right now. That's for sure. <laughs> mm. Oh, it's there's bands out there, man. It's just people aren't. It's, I think I don't blame people. It's just that the internet means that everything's available to anybody from any era. So there's no movements anymore. Remember when when there was like, you know, Mm. there was the glam Mm. thing, then there was the grunge thing, and then there was the Britpop thing, and then there was the electronica thing. And then after that, Mm. it's sort of, you know, there was that Jet and Vines thing with garage rock, whatever you want to call it. Yeah. You know, the white stripes and shit. But God, after that, man, it really, there's no popular movements. And and, and I think, yeah, yeah, it's, it's really interesting to sort of live, we're about... 15 years into there not having been any genuinely popular movement like that everybody across the globe as a whole got into because we don't yeah. need to anymore. We don't need to be dictated to from that from the perspective of dictation, if you like, what music is good or what music is bad or what have you. People are just getting into the music that they want. And as I say, it's the yin and the yeah. yang of that. And the negative side of that is is that um, live music will probably never be a thing again like it was back in the day because it won't be a movement, so to speak. That's my point there. And, and and I think, yeah. you know, I'm a musician, man, so I know how much fun I have on stage and I can only imagine how fun it is for you guys playing originals music. Well, and, but you're, so you're, you're playing heavy heavy music, are you? No, I play covers, man. So I do like a lot of funk, disco, you know, Kylie, yeah. that sort of stuff. So like I wouldn't call it corporate covers, but you know where we're going. Like, <clears throat> we play to families. And so all. one of the big differences is that, and this is one, one thing that I do remember very palpably, is competition and, in, and striving to be better than your peers. Yes. Yeah, that's a big and, one. And, yeah. and, and that is really crucial to what we're talking about. And so if you start a band now that doesn't have any music, that doesn't have another three or four bands around you doing the same thing, who have you got to be better than? Mm. And, I, and, I, and, I, and I really think it's important because I know that with Horsehead, it wasn't just like, oh, yeah, we're going to... You know, oh yeah, we're going to just sort of play music and <laughs> you know do our thing, and it's going to be really nice. And we'll just sort of draw from our own spirits. It's bullshit. We're actually looking at the world around us, watching bands going, "My God, look at this! Wow, I want to do that. Yeah. I want to do that. I want to do it better than that. I know where we can take that." And you, you know, you you're a part of this kind of um, race to greatness. It's being inspired by your cohort, by your by your co music makers, mm-hmm. and you know I thank all of these other bands in Melbourne for White Horse that exists. And it's not it's not just you know the international big rock acts that inspired us. It's the local guys that inspired us and girls for that matter. Yes, nice. Um, you yeah. know who, who were doing things. I'm like, wow, Killing Time. Wow, Josie, Jason, the Argonauts. Wow, you know. All these acts just kind of, wow, how they sound. Good does that sound? What's that guitar tone? What the amp is that? I want that amp. I'm going to get that amp. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I kind of, you know, and you know, the equi- the modern day equivalent to a lot of that stuff is rehearsal rooms. That's the only time you actually get to meet people of lo- the like minded. <laughs> yeah. You can't do it on stage anymore because there aren't the, right. the gigs going on. And I notice these days the only chance that a lot of uh, local bands have to get together is if it's like one of those small local festivals. You know those things that are starting yeah. to pop up a lot, or if it's or if you're supporting a band, you know you're one of five bands on a bill. But I, I think that yeah. that I was watching Wolves in the Throne Room the other night, a black metal band from Seattle, and uh, yeah. there was four support, three supports. 
Now you can kind of get through that, but man, I remember the days when you'd watch, I don't know, Faith No More, and they'd have one support, and it'd be she had. So you'd, yep. you'd have an opportunity to sort of like really appreciate the band, if you, if you know what I'm saying. You weren't sort of fatigued by yep. the time Faith No More came on, and you had to sort of conserve your energy, is what I'm saying. I find that's what people are doing yep. these days, or that you're going to a separate part of the pub and drinking. Um, yep. So yeah, it's it's a I don't know for bands these days. I can understand why there's not, you know, rock rock music and heavy metal is, is probably never been more popular than with the fans right now. But the media and the like yep. aren't paying any attention to it. So, and that's usually through the media that you can drive change or through movements that you can drive change. But I don't know, man. I mean, it's 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 one of those things. At least we've got uh, bands like yourself to sort of listen to and sort of bring us back to that era. You know, now that you've yep. done this with the box set, so. So with with the box set, you know, we we talk about um, it being timely and all the rest of it. But what was the the inspiration behind it all? Because I take it, I mean, you've been broken up now, or haven't been doing things for close to twenty years or thereabouts. So, so did you just decide yeah. now was the right time, or did somebody approach you? Somebody approached us, but Golden Rover Records, um, Mark Herber, Alexander, um, he basically got in contact and you know, he said, "I want to do it. I want to put together, you know, a box set and and." Um, <clears throat> I, I sort of thought, oh, okay. If you, if you want to do that, okay. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> but um, but but one of, one of the things that I found um, um, appealing to the uh, for the, in the idea was that we were going to get our our all of our repertoire put in the right place or uh, in the digital domain. So you know, on Spotify and on iTunes because it was a dog's breakfast. There was a couple of bands that had existed called Horsehead. And oh, yeah, yeah. We only had we only had three or four songs kind of there, yeah. and I thought I'd be nice for all of that work to be forever digitally preserved. So we were going to get that out of this, and it's sort of, it's actually now there. Hmm. Um, and um, I that that's that was the oh, probably the most important thing for me um, but then people got to, you know, buy this kind of, we, we put a lot of work into the box set, um, and the booklet and the albums and the artwork and, and people who wanted to have a memento of their memories could have that. And, uh, then we thought, okay, we'll do one show to support this and to, to, and, you know, people were really, really happy. So that's the main thing. There's no other agenda. Mm-hmm. It's just to kind of spread a bit of happiness in this horribly dark world that we live in. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Somebody's got to do it. Might them. as well be you guys. Yes. You know, <laughs> yes. flipping with loud music, happiness. You know. <laughs> yeah, indeed. Yeah, and 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 uh, I was talking to Fiona from Def FX not too long ago, and uh, one of the things that I said to her was I was a big Def FX fan in the in, back in the day in terms of when they first came out. Still am, but I never really stopped listening to Def FX, and I made that comment to her, and she said, "Oh my God, so many people have said that." Has that been similar for you yep. guys as well? It has been actually. Yeah, a bit. Yeah, um, yeah. Um, people do have horsehead records in their their daily playlists, mm. and um, it sort of seems to cross generations as well. You know, people's kids seem to be getting into it, mm. and I, I really that's uh, always like that. My own son, who's now thirty, um, he he was always used to say to me, well, you know, in his twenties, he would be like. You guys, are, you know, you don't realise what you did there, and uh, I, I always felt like he was being quite honest with me. I sort of think, well, yeah, you are blood, so you're going to kind of appreciate it on some cellular level. But you know, he kept saying, "My no, mates are right into it. Like, yeah, this is good. It, sh- it shouldn't die. It shouldn't disappear." So um, that's a nice, uh, that's a nice product of it too. So I thought, well, you know, maybe kids are twenty years a twenty years of age. In twenty years' time, are going to be able to discover it. That that would be fun too. Yeah, yeah, I and mean, that's the thing, isn't it? I think if music is when music's created very genuinely, like yours is, it does stand the mm. test of time. You don't realise that people pick up on these things, but whenever they pick up on them, they just find them and then they share it, and then it goes viral a little bit, and they share, you know, and and people connect with it on that level because it's been done for the right reasons. And I always say to, I always think to myself with musicians who are getting a bit. Um, you know, jaded with playing music and all the rest of it, I say, well, look, just do what you guys did. You know, just put it down for a little bit and come back to it a bit later. And if you never come back to it, well, you still got your music that's out there, and people will yeah. eventually find it because it's genuine, it's real, and 
People always want to connect with real stuff. God knows you only have to go into one of these suburban shopping centres to get depressed and upset about fucking where we're at with humanity <laughs> in that, you know, this yeah. overly consumeristic lifestyle that a lot of people plug into. And that's that works for you guys, I think, you know, because eventually people want real and they reach I think, often for music. Um, and you're absolutely right. I, I was talking to someone the other day about this. At the time when Horsehead were doing their thing, we were never really slotted into a pigeonhole. It was probably to our detriment mm. um, because we because we were so uh, varied in our influences and we were so interested in keeping our music um, full of life from a musical point of view and and we were adventurous. And we didn't sort of adhere to any rules. And um, that, as you just sort of suggested, has kept us in good stead as the years roll by because people listen to it and they go, well, that is pretty free. Hmm. You know, that, that doesn't sound like it's stuck in a genre. Um, you know, um, so, yeah, I hmm. agree with that. Yeah, yeah. Hey, look, I got, the, I got the bio too from John as well when he sent it through and there's some... Really interesting things in the bio that I probably haven't read from a lot of other Australian artists either, and it didn't come across as a boast or anything like that. Because I, I remember the waves you, I do remember reading about the waves you guys were making back in the day. But you did a showcase gig for Madonna. It talks about here. So can you tell us about that? Well, when we when we uh, first did our first set of demos, or one of our early sets of demos. We were getting managed by a local guy here, and he knew someone. He had a family friend who worked as a lawyer in a company called Grubman, Indersky, and Schindler mm -hmm. in New York. And uh, these guys just so happened to be the lawyers for Michael Jackson and Madonna and all sorts of – like they were the, the one of the top music law firms. Mm -hmm. And this young guy, John Ehrlich, who worked there, he listened and he said, this is fantastic, this stuff. So he kind of started sending it to a few people. And over there, the lawyers would often be, you know, instrumental in an a and r it's like getting yeah. the band noticed. And um, so all of a sudden, he had brokered this deal with a guy called Freddie DeMann. And Freddie DeMann ran a record label called Maverick, which was money from Warners given to Madonna to have her own record label. I think... No, I think you've spot um, on with that. There was Deftones, there was The Rentals, there was a few bands on there. So I know exactly the one you're talking about, yeah. Yeah, and and so uh, Freedom Man said, come out to LA and um, and uh, I'll buy you tickets and um, play for me. <laughs> <laughs> so we went to LA um, and we ended up playing for Freddie the Man. We ended up playing also in another room with a whole lot of other people from some other record companies. Um, one in particular that was of very great interest to me, and I can't remember the name of the guy or the company, but it will come to me. But we won't have time for it to come to me. Um, <laughs> anyway, things things went a bit haywire. We were a bit rough and ready. No one really wanted to fight. We ended up going to New York as well and playing for RCA. Uh, did we play for us yet, or we just had meetings with them? I can't even remember. Uh, but um, uh, so it was a gr it was a great big adventure. It was mad. It wasn't something that felt like it was supposed to be in our trajectory. Yep. It felt like a a funny story to us, not a like oh we've got it mate we're going to be huge in America. I always thought uh, this. This something doesn't quite feel right about this, but yeah, cool. Let's go for let's it. Go let's for go it. do yeah. this. <laughs> and um, it was, it was, you know, I remember having a meeting with uh, Freddie DeMann and these two other guys. One of them had started MTV, and the other one was for Warner Chapel Publishing, and they were big wigs, and they looked and sounded and acted like big wigs. <laughs> and they were across the other side of the table, yeah. and I was like in a stinglet and shorts, and you know, I had shaved head and. Um, Andy was, you know, there and I think, and I think, I think were we all there or I can't remember who was there. And I remember just looking at these guys and they were sort of talking shit as far as I was concerned. Like they weren't saying anything. Yeah. And, um, it's because I'm, you know, I'm just an Aussie bloke who just needs to be communicated with. I don't, uh, I'm not going to 
there's a very interesting way of communicating in Los Angeles. It's kind of weird. It's all about vibe mm-hmm. and um, being impressive. And I remember saying to one of them, what do you do? <laughs> <laughs> it's probably the first time anybody had been honest enough with them to actually say, what, what are you doing here? Yeah. What, what do you actually do? Mm. Like, what are you doing? You know, and it's like, the, uh, so I suppose to them it's a dumb question. Because, what do you mean, what do I do? I'm, I represent the company. <laughs> yeah. But what do you actually do in the day-to-day? Like, what's your job yeah, and Yeah, that's right. Yeah. What's the, what's the, what are you doing next? Oh, I'm having lunch, you know. Oh, mm. uh, what are you doing after that? I'm, you know. <laughs> um, uh, anyway, I just felt like we were fish, fish, fish out of water. Mm. Um, and uh, they probably thought so, too. Uh, but um, that, was a, that was a fun story. And then we came back and uh, ended up signing to Michael Gibinski's label. And Michael was a good, great supporter. And, um, yeah, that's a that's a much better fit for you guys. Yeah, yeah, that one there. And yeah. and yeah, it's it's interesting hearing you talk and how frank and you are about it because I've had conversations similar to the one that you said. So you've got a you've got a story here that some people would milk until there was no sun to come up, meaning that they would say, yeah. well, we were so good at what we did, we actually had a, were invited, they would use words like that, to go and play yeah. in the States for Madonna's management. There were all these people. And by the way, the guy who started MTV was there as well. So that shows you how important and impressive we are. It's like, but you've turned that on its head and gone, look, they do this with bands. This is what happens. But you saw through the bullshit. You saw it for actually what it was. They're just fishing. They're just sort of seeing if there's an easy win here or this is my take on it. And they'd probably, yeah. you know, manipulate you guys and you'd probably sign one of those bloody awful late album contracts that they were synonymous for, so so synonymous for signing back in the day that lock bands into producing just shit with no creative or artistic mm. control in the way that, that they were used to. Um you know, mm. so so I'm I'm so glad you say that because I think <laughs> I think I'm, I'm so used to hearing people reinvent history as to yeah, how important right. they were and stuff. And, and I really appreciate you doing that, man, because I think people need to hear some of these stories that the music industry, it's its probably easier now to navigate than it was back in the day because you had to go through these fuckwits who really didn't have any skin in the game at all. And don't matter what they'd done prior to their life in the music industry, they didn't understand music didn't because their skills weren't necessarily transferable. And there was a ton of bands that lost these companies mm. I'd like to, mate, here's a good question for you, or it might be a question that nobody can truly answer, but I'd love to know how many bands have signed with a major label and actually made money compared to bands that haven't made money, because I reckon there's only the top 5 to 10% that make money, like the Mariah Careys and the like, Nirvanas. Well, but, that, but that's, a standard, that's, a stand, that's the standard model, or was the standard model, and uh, yeah. in the defence of the record companies, uh, for, and I, I, I can't remember who said it, but you know, M- Mushroom Records, hmm. uh, it, it, we wouldn't have been signed to them if it wasn't for Kylie Minogue because they don't have the... the, the, the she's the one who's creating the turnover. Oh, I get what you're saying. Yeah, that's and so true. Yeah, yeah. So, so she, she, for every million dollars that they kind of um, have to spare up from her is they invest uh, in 10 bands. And they, you know, yeah. 100k here, 100k there, 100k here, 100k there. Oh, that one popped out and made 500. Rightio, we're a little bit okay. Okay, those guys, we lost 300 on those guys. <laughs> you know, yeah. it's sort of that was that was the model. It, it was like being, uh, it's just a numbers game. And uh, the idea yeah. was to try and obviously, a record company would love to have every act on it, on its books hugely successful. It's just not the nature of the beast. No one can predict the future like that. They're all trying to go, okay, is, is this the next band that's going to make us a lot of money? And we got, we were in that machine in America. Are we the next band that's going to make a lot of money? No, they're not the next band that's going to make us a lot of money. Okay, uh, you know. And it was a really interesting changing of the guard at the time because hmm. we'd come from uh, one of Pretty Demand's biggest acts was Billy Idol. Yeah, and he had sort of created a very, very visual manufactured. I mean, Billy Idol and Steve Stevens are a fantastic musical pair. Oh yeah, great. Don't yeah. get me wrong; there's nothing wrong with the music, but it was very, you know, saleable uh, from the way they looked. And then we'd all of a sudden we'd launched into um, Seattle sound, and you know where you don't dress up, you dress down. And mm-hmm. we were right in between those two eras. You were, um, that's right, yeah. And and so we kind of, one guy in the band would dress up and the other guy in the band would dress down. 
Like that's almost that's the only way we could respond, um, because we were sort of I don't know we were. Some people liked the old school, and some people liked the new school. It was weird. Anyway, right, so yeah, you you broke. We, I, I was I started getting into music when you guys really started coming through, and and I try to talk to people about that two or three year period before Nirvana broke when things started to shift with Jane's Addiction. And remember Warrior Soul. Mm-hmm. Remember Warrior Soul when they came out. Faith No More. Um, oh, the Cult, yeah. of course. There was these bands, and it it felt like it was a morphing over from a lot of the glitz and literally the glam of a lot of poison and all of that sort of shit. And it started to get more yeah. street again, you know, and then of course yeah. Nirvana came along and just blew it up. And then it was only a year or two after that, that it became fairly corporatized, but there was that era there wasn't there where that that's, I consider that my home era from the perspective that that's when I got into King's X 24 seven spies, all of these bands that they weren't grunge, you know, these guys, it was the emphasis was on playing your instrument as the famous grunge epithet was right. more punk and more, it's all about the feel and the vibe, man. And I remember going to some of those so-called grunge gigs, those all ages gigs back in the day. And a lot of the bands that were just, they were terrible. You know, yeah. um, right, <laughs> that's the reality. Like people well, go, they were all, cool. they, well, the funny thing about it is that the Varna were a fantastic band. Um, mm. And, and they, they were as manufactured as anybody. They were just manufactured to be unmanufactured. And that, and you know, you, you, you talk about, I mean, Kurt Cobain was a smart bloke, and they they went through all sorts of throws. I'm not quite sure. I know people that he's got. You know, people probably know the story better than I do. Hmm. But this idea of uh, how commercialised are we? Are we going to let this thing be? And then when they got uh, Nevermind mixed by Andy Wallace, and they, they kind of commercialised the garage sound. Yeah, big time. Yeah, and they. And they had an, an, some amazing songs to, to, to help that process. Hmm. But that was really what, what was it. Because if they had stayed rough, they wouldn't have dominated the planet. So they took hmm. it and they commercialised it and then they dominated the planet. Yeah, and he famously, Kurt famously hated that mixing that Andy Wallace did. Yeah, um, yeah, yes. And which because is, it was commercial. Yeah, and then and then he worked with Steve Albini, who produced a, or in my view, it's a fairly unlistenable record. I'm not a big fan of In Utero, because uh, I think the songs are okay, but it's just, I think you've got to be a fan by then, and I think a lot of people get sort of caught up in it. But, um, but you know, in terms of the big Nirvana thing, they weren't sort of listening to the music for what it was as a standalone uh, standalone product, if I can call it that, for for the sake of the conversation. But yeah, you're on point mm. there with that. Yeah, polishing the garage sound. And the interesting thing for me, mate, is I've got a uh, a theory that see all these bands like Nirvana and stuff, they're influenced by our music, Australian music, meaning the Australian garage rock sound that started way back with the Saints. You know, which was right in my view, mistakenly called punk. To me, that's in the grand tradition of the MC5 and Iggy the stooges yeah you know yes. that's that lineage it actually i don't know how it happened but it went from detroit to the garages of sydney and melbourne and and brisbane too it must be said with the saints and and this ah. music and then you start getting bands like you, um, there's a book there for you and you can write a book it's called yeah uh <laughs> why <laughs> how australia influenced the world rock scene <laughs> in 1980 through 1990 Mate, I could, I'd love to do it. I'm a, I'm a journalist, so I mean, I'm, I'm I'm working at the Bulletin here on the Gold Coast. So I'd I'd love to do this yeah. stuff. It's just time and, frankly, the money side of it, mate. You know, because I've got two kids. So I've, I mean, I've got so mm. many. The thing is, I tell you this, Cam. I've got so many opportunities to work with people, like serious international people, but like people from the states, and they're like, they're like, man, help me do this, help me do that, and I'm like, man, I need four of me to keep up yeah. and sometimes I feel like journalists don't do the necessary work actually I'll say this for a matter of fact there are no real music journalists these days I don't think because we've all got to have a hand in I do a lot of sports writing and everything right but yeah, yeah, you know yeah. what I mean like music journalists like back in the day like Murray Engelhart and those guys where you could just focus yep, yep. you could just focus on writing about music um, yep. and, and I just think that's like that all over the globe and there's so many great stories that aren't being told because of it you know what I mean? Mm. And and that one mm. story there, I don't think people... Uh, you know, it's hearsay for people overseas, but I certainly believe what I've said there, that Australian music did influence the United States from the perspective that it gave the green light to guys like a very young Kurt Cobain and Chris Cornell and the Soundgarden guys via bands like Lime Spiders and shit. You know what I mean? 
like yeah, wow. like lime spiders to yeah. actually go forth. And I, I, the reason I think I'm right in that is because bands like Goo Goo Dolls, who were massive at the time, had Slave Girl yeah. recorded Slave Girl and put that on their big album at the time, man. And that's a man right. a band that nobody had hard, hardly heard of in Australia. One of the biggest bands at the time in the states was was covering, you know. So. Yeah. So I think, man, there's there's a lot to it, and and I think you know we, your your place in all of that is, and I mean it is like being one of the last truly great Oz pub rock bands to really emerge from, you know, you can you can sort of say that you emerged from the era when the Gold Coast you you played Gold Coast Playroom, I think, didn't you? A couple of times. Yes, yes, we did. You know what I'm talking about, then, don't you? I mean, it's that era, it's yeah. that music, and it, it only existed because. You know, you guys had the wherewithal and the drive and the energy to do it, but then you had the outlet by these wonderful venues like the Playroom to play in front of a yeah. very receptive audience, and that made that that was so electric across the Pacific. You know? Yeah, and and that's yeah right. Yeah, it's my take on it. I mean, I'm, you know, I mean, <laughs> what can I say? I've had a long time to think about. Uh, these I'd things. love it. I love. I'd love to read a. I'd love to read an extrapolation from you. You know, talking about. And, you know, with, with examples to listen to, and even just from the point of view of actually breaking it down from a musical influence uh, kind of standpoint, like, you know, listening to this track and, you know, this is what they made, you know, six months later, this is, listen to this, you know, listen to listen to what they've drawn upon. That'd be fascinating. Yeah, it's it's like, you know, the REM thing, like they sounded like a certain way, but then they heard the go-betweens and then they started to sound different afterwards. Is that what That's what I'm talking about. And, yeah, yeah and I the, love it. Yeah, and this is and the, and and I don't think like we're we're very much interested in talking about this this subversive. This is this is a really important point. Australian rock historians and musicians and people who talk about the industry here in Australia, we we like to talk about how subversive it is. You know, fuck the system, all of this sort of stuff. But there's far more to it. We we actually are musically influential, like um, Roland S. Howard. There you go. Mm -hmm. He's one of he's one of yeah. the top five most influential guitarists of all time in my view. Like he's up there with Eddie Van Halen, but in a very different way. You know what I yeah. mean? And yeah. and it's it's that you know from for people listening who, who know about who don't know Roland S. Howard was uh, Nick Cave's guitarist in the birthday yeah. party yeah. and uh, a few other things there. And he stopped. I mean, there was nobody that sounded like him before him. There was just him. Yeah, right. And then then after that through the eighties, nineties, and even. His influence, I think, is so apparent now in a lot of the shit that I get sent from Ear Split PR and all these agencies. It's like I can hear. Um, you might not. Be, are you connected to a lot of heavy, heavy music at the moment? What's going on with heavy music? No. So. No. no. There's a band from the states that were called Neurosis. I think they're still around. Yeah. But all yeah. and I remember them from the 80s and 90s, and all of this music. So so much of this music coming out now sounds a lot like them, but with a bit of black metal mixed in. It's so right. that's a band from the states, but I think Roland and his guitar playing and Nick and what he was doing has influenced a lot of bands in a in a more prominent sense now too. It's just yeah. sort of crossed. I don't know, man. It's just people pick things up because of the internet and go, I like the sound of that. I'm gonna I'm gonna recreate that now. You know, so yeah, right. Um, <laughs> you know, and and the other thing too, mate. I read is that you, you shared management in the U.S. with Kiss. So. Um, was that with, um, what's his, I can't remember the guy's name now. He's a Motley Crue guy. Larry well. Mazer. Larry, oh, Larry. Mazer. He was really, he was really, uh, well, he was just around on that first trip that we went over there. Um, and he, he, <clears throat> I'm not quite sure what his motivations were. He, he, um, he's a lovely guy actually from memory, but he, he managed Kiss, but I suspect he was more of a, uh, and a management associate, because I think Gene, you know, they, they, they were a very kind of self-driven machine. Hmm. Um, you know, it wasn't like, oh, I'm, I, I, I'm sure he tried to sell it as such, but it wasn't like he did anything to change their fortune. Hmm. He just made sure that, you know, the machine ran well. Um, yep. And, um, you know, we ended up at a kiss show and, and we met Paul and Gene you know, in a line of people meeting them with the record company Mercury Records. <laughs> Sorry, it's just and, uh, so Gene and, Simmons. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, and just, you know, just I remember just sort of shaking these guys' hands and it was like meeting a waxwork. <laughs> yeah, I get what you're saying. <laughs> oh, no, it's, it's so weird, Somebody isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> it's not a warm occasion, you yeah, know. Yeah, I know what you're saying. It should be like <laughs> the whole kiss thing is just so weird because I, 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 at times in my life, I've really tried to get into kiss and I just can't do it. 
just, it's not my thing. And then you hear all of these stories about Gene Simmons every time he talks to somebody, and I can't do the voice, but you'll pick up the phone and you'll call somebody and be like, this is Gene Simmons from Kiss. <laughs> it's like... There's always that, there's always but that's, that I think people who are into Kiss, that's what they're into. They're into the kind of... The, the unreachable. Yeah. The unreachable kind of commodity. Whereas <laughs> I've never really quite understood it. I, um, I, had, just, a, you know, I, like, I had a chat yeah. to... Um, Paul Stanley's son, Evan, who was in a band called The Dives a couple of years ago. And I've got to tell you, he's, he's a lovely young fella, you know, so don't uh, worry, don't want I, to bet. Appear, I don't want to appear as though I'm dissing Paul specifically because I'm not. Disingenuous. Yeah, yeah, but, I totally dig it. You, yeah. you know what I, I mean? Like, they certainly, yeah. Gene, Gene just comes across as a guy. I've tried to sort of see his perspective on things at time to time, from time to time. And, and I think sometimes I'm like, yeah, I think I understand where Gene's coming from. But then he says some other bullshit and I'm like, I don't get what he's where he's coming from at all now. Like it just he has all of the money in the fucking world. He doesn't need more money. So I don't get like like all of these constant tours and shit and and shooting down the involvement of Paul of um Ace and um Jesus well, I'm interviewing Peter. Peter Ace and Peter and anything but, God, the, but the, the fans love you understand Gene the fans love this shit, you know? Like just give yeah. us what we want <laughs> if you're a fan of the band that is. Yeah, yeah, well, you know, the motivations of people, I suppose, you know, at the end of the day, often very, very successful people. It's like if they were only motivated by money and nice things, it may not have happened. Yeah. Motivated by ego and power, you know, and then we're seeing the ramifications of that possibly with Gene. Yeah, uh, it's it's not like we, I think we suspect he's probably got a fairly healthy ego. <laughs> fairly, yeah, oh, fairly no, decent. I just, something sort of just gives me that impression. I'm not quite sure what it is. How how on earth he hasn't been me too? You know all this me too stuff that's going on on Twitter. Oh my god! How he survived that is he's he, he unless he's done out of court settlements. I guess we'll never know. But holy shit, you know how has he but survived? Maybe it? maybe me too. Just sort of collectively goes. You tell us something we don't know. Yeah. Maybe he's just so. Maybe he figured out the game early on and went. It's I've got to be as big a player as I possibly can, so it's impossible to pin anything on me because who's going to come forward? It's like Gene Simmons hit on me. It's like I'd be disappointed if he didn't hit on you. He hits on everything. Yeah, that, that, <laughs> yeah well, that's right, and it's it's like yeah, I, yeah. I mean, it's yeah. rock and roll, and maybe he's never done. Maybe there isn't a woman out there who thinks he's caught, he's done something bad by her. Maybe he, you know, who knows? Who are we to judge? Well, he was never in his in his uh, for him going for him is that he's never been drunk, so he's never been under the right. influence. You know that about Gene. He doesn't Gene yeah. Paul had never taken drugs and never drunk. So you've got yeah. to assume that everything that he's ever done in his life, he's been in complete control of. Yeah, yeah. You know, um, balls to the rest of us who like getting a few. Having a few tins and going out on the town, you know. Um, yeah, yeah. You know, God knows we've all uh, got not in that respect. I'm not talking about in any weird sort of, you know, uh, me too respect. But you know what I mean. We've all sort of woken up after a big night and thought, oh my God, who did I talk to and what did I say? That sort of thing. Yeah, and absolutely. Uh, you know absolutely. what I mean. Absolutely, and that's I, well, that's the whole point of the me too thing. I think in a way as well is to have us um, have a little reality check about our behaviour. And you know, I mean. I, I, that's one of the things that I don't mind, you know, I mean, there's some things that have happened and there's some been things that have been said um, by certain quarters that are quite alienating. I sort of think, well, that's not going to help your cause. Hmm. It's sort of alienating maildom. But then on the other hand, the good side of it is for, for people to kind of have a little reality check about how they do behave, you know. And this is just, I'm talking about people who aren't serial predators. Oh, absolutely! I know about, what you're saying. Yeah, you, I know what you're saying. You know, just just uh, every everyday people, and especially in the, in 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 the rock and roll industry, with a place where you can be deified, and you yeah. have to be responsible for that. You know. Look, I can tell you, mate. Look, I've told you I play covers, and I can't tell. I mean, they're only coming up to me because I've got a guitar in my hand. But yeah. I can't tell you how many times I've been hit on by women, and it's really surreal because I'm married and I'm not in any danger of being of doing anything silly or anything like that. My primary concern yeah. is always are they going to get home? Because most of the women who come up and hit on me are drunk, 
and yeah, they're just looking for a good time, and I get that, and I'm a I consider myself. I've got two daughters, but it's not because of that. But I'm a very safe pair of hands around women. You know what I mean? Yep. Like I'm not. I, I'm just. Yep. I find I'm comfortable around women. I don't hit on women unnecessarily. I don't hit on women at all. I mean, I'm married. Jesus Christ, you know. But but yep. I think the problem is is that especially. I don't know whether you've been keeping up with this stuff with Tracy Spicer, the news presenter. Have you seen what's happened there? You know, she's the champion of the Me Too movement in this country. And she is suing women that she asked to come to her to share their stories. And because she pub- she publicised uh, some of their personal details on a recent current affairs program or a documentary, they said, look, we want yeah. you to take that bit out because I didn't authorise for you to share all of these details here. She's suing them. So the, the problem with the Me Too movement is that it's a toxic movement unto itself. You know, with using that example, there are many more examples that I can use, but I'll give you that example now. And... The problem with the Me Too movement, it it quick it went from being let's protect women, let's res, res, respect women, and let's face it, anybody decent does that anyway, to now let's demonise men, and they use any example that they can, any one one off example to you know the worst example of, of one of us is the example that's set for the rest of us sort of thing. You know what I mean by that? So yeah, there's that aspect of it, and but I, I thought isn't that interesting with this Tracy Spicer thing recently because I mean that's that's very poor form what she's doing. She's somebody who women trusted to share their stories with, and she's sharing stuff that she shouldn't be doing, and she's threatening to sue them. Well, who knows what the truth is? Who knows what the truth is there? Like that, 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 uh, uh, that uh, um, you know, might be worthy of a further investigation on that because there could be. She does strike me as a pretty decent person. I can't imagine she would just be. Oh no! Check of, it out. No, don't get me wrong, man. I mean, I'm not. Maybe, shit, maybe, maybe, maybe what's there. happened is that there. They're doing something that's putting her in an incredibly un, un, un kind of workoutable legal position, and she has to do that <laughs> to kind of stop herself oh, from going to jail or something. I don't know. Look, I tell you, either but, um, way, it's a poor, it's a poor look, though, isn't it? You know what I mean? Like overall, even if if there's further investigation required, right now, given that she hasn't made her, given her, she hasn't, there's no public statement out there that I'm aware of at the time of me talking about this. Um, from her, yeah. there's plenty of shit out there at the moment on social media, and the problem with that is that there are women who think, "Well, can I trust anybody with my story?" Then, and that's that's my overall point with all of this, you know. Yeah, right, 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 right. Yeah, yeah, that's that's a very good point. You know. Um, look, I th- I think I think at the end of the day, though, if we step back, if we step back, and don't look at any in particular stories, I think it's probably and most it's a positive step forward for western society to be having this conversation that sometimes and often goes to extremes but we really have to learn how to kind of not worry about the extremes and and when those people who are who want to sort of have language which points the finger at men i mean you know i've had my moments with that and just gone whoa it's this is just not I'm I'm a decent person I'm a really really decent person and I feel bad about this I feel like fuck you Mm. for want of a better term Um, but and I just had to have a really close kind of look at my own reactions on that and go well I just have to calm down and uh, and I do agree with listening to, to women and just not saying what I think but it's difficult. You get pushed. It's, it's a hard world. <laughs> oh, it's it's a tough one, man. Yeah, it's, it's I've always you know I've, whenever I, I don't have too many of these conversations. You, someone like yourself who's been around the block a few times, I feel comfortable doing it on, on these sort of things, you know. But um, man, I'm I'm just all about having long form conversations that don't upset anybody at the end of the day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Maybe you ed- edit out the fuck you part. <laughs> <laughs> I don't even remember you saying it. <laughs> I'll have a listen. What's that? I don't even remember you saying it. So, <laughs> are you talking about the, what you just said? Well, just, you said earlier. Yeah, look, like I don't know. It's just oh, you just got to be so careful. I just you just don't know whether you're gonna. Oh, this, this is the whole thing about this whole Me Too movement. Hmm. Um, you you don't know where you stand. You don't know whether what you think is right. It's, you know, you don't. You, you're questioning everything about everything, and if there's a whole lot of people who are screaming because of something, and you go, oh, "I don't understand that," then it's difficult. You just got to be quiet, and hopefully, it uh, it precipitates out of your mind yeah. the right position to take. Yeah. And uh, 
I think that's. A, I think you, you're, you live in Melbourne. You live the suburbs of Melbourne or around Melbourne? Yeah. Is that right? Yeah. I think there's there's some, I do, yeah. there's something particularly in Melbourne, less so in Sydney these days, but particularly with Melbourne with this bloody group think that's happening, and um, it's causing chaos. There's no two ways about it. Because to your point, people exactly what you just said then is how most people are thinking. They don't know what to say and what is appropriate and what yeah. is inappropriate and all the rest of it. And I yeah. I don't maybe it's the Queenslander in me coming out, but I just think fuck off you know like i'm not saying anything that's designed to be offensive to anybody okay if i offend you yeah then maybe you need to look at your own values but at the end of the day we live in a democracy okay and i stand on my own two feet about things that i say i consider myself a, a well-read person um and i try to keep up with current affairs on twitter but i don't pay any attention to a lot of the bullshit and a lot of the the nonsense and all the rest of it and you know this this the, the gender pronoun thing and all the rest of it you can only imagine what my stance is on all of that stuff and my overall view is this i don't i don't care what anybody does with their life i don't care how they do it how they want to represent themselves in public but when you start designing programs that that obtain public money, i.e. our taxpayer funds, that then enforce other people to refer to you the way you want to be referred to or the way you or, or to think the way that you think more to the point, then I'm I'm out of there. And I I, I won't even argue. Yeah, well this go. is well this is and I'm not quite sure that that seemed to me like a, a, a bit of a storm in a teacup well maybe not a storm in a teacup, but th- this is the Jordan Peterson thing, right? Where he's in hmm. he's he's in a university in Canada. And somebody proposes that it will be against some law for you to refer to somebody in a way that they don't don't wish to be referred to. And he he was like, well, I'm quite happy to refer to you as you wish me to refer to you. But if I don't, and that breaks the law, that's a big problem. Yeah, Bill 16C. Yeah, I've done a lot of reading about this because we've got the same, right. same constitution and here. Yeah. That, so all of a sudden he was some crazy right-wing motherfucker. Hmm. Um, whereas really what he was just saying was it's that that's... And, you know, and, this, and the same thing happened in Australia when we had the, this sort of uh, uh, talk about the vilification laws. And it was, it's really, really line ball where you go, okay, if somebody wants to say something, are you going to make that, are you going to make that, Turn into they're breaking crime. the law? Yeah, exactly, yeah. You know, it's, it's, and I'm a lefty, right? Mm-hmm. And I just kind of, I sort of wasn't quite sure what was going on there. I, I'm not big on Andrew Bolt, but in a way, if you look, I remember George Brandis, you know, he was, he was the enemy of the leftist state. Mm. I reckon it wasn't all cut and dry, that stuff. There are laws against people being, being, you know, doing certain things all over the place when it comes to the media. Mm-hmm. And um, it's like, yeah, I'm not quite sure about this. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, but you're old. You're old school centre left. You're like a traditional Labor voter, as I'd say. You know, and there's not. And on bother, not, you know, when I say, of course, there's nothing wrong with that. But that's common yeah. sense. It's this. This rise of these these 18 and 19 year olds that see we grew up in a time where we saw the berlin war fall and we could see the interviews live happening with people and we saw how happy they were that they finally got access to western style democracy now i know that doesn't work for everybody but you and i have grown yeah. up in an era where through the cold war i learned all about that when it was happening and these kids haven't yeah. these kids haven't haven't spoken to people and i've got a couple of musicians that i've spoken to that have had to flee venezuela for example and yeah. these kids yeah. these days think that and all of this stuff comes under the broader socialist umbrella right whether it's this bill 16c thing um or what have you but all these kids think that look people in the past they just haven't understood socialism in its correct form we're going to do it right this time it's like never in history has socialism been implemented except for at the barrel of a gun that is a fact and 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 yeah yeah and yeah i totally agree with you but um socialism is probably not the word we should be using because Unfortunately, it's been tarnished, but, uh, you know, I was having this conversation with someone. So, uh, anyway, look, I'll cut you off. Where were you heading with that? Oh, no, it's, it's, you're, on the, you're on point. You're on the same track. And the point is, oh. is, that, is that they demonise the West, Western civilization. They demonise capitalism. None of these things are perfect, by the way, but for God's sakes, they haven't spoken to enough people. My, my father-in-law had to escape Croatia, former Yugoslavia, to save from getting right. killed. You know, I mean, yeah, right. this, they don't have... You understand what I'm saying about first-hand 
interactions with people yeah. who've experienced these regimes and understood what it looks like. So they only get the internet version, which has been prefabbed by their public university, whether it be Monash or uh, University of Queensland or what have you. And they come yeah. out with these views and they're like, who taught you this shit? <laughs> like, you know, like who who's teaching yeah. you that that social like that it was uh, it was because socialism that drove the Russian army that defeated the Nazis? It was like fucking hell. My grandfather didn't fight against the Japanese just so you could say that shit. You know, it's not it's yeah. it's a collective effort. You can't attribute any, especially with this world. I noticed that whether you've been keeping up with this, but there's this thing nowadays where they they. These kids claim that, that it was Russia that actually won World War Two for the Allies, and that the Allies' involvement was really just um, circumstantial, if you like, because England was being bombed. And <laughs> I have uh, not heard of that one. <laughs> oh, you, you read and look. These are Twitter conversations, so they're not coming from informed sources, by the way. But it gives you an insight yeah. into people's opinions and what they're talking about in dorm rooms or in share houses or what have you. And because nobody's there to challenge them on that and say. Where are you getting this shit from? Who's teaching you this shit? Because it's not right. You know, um, we're all entitled to an opinion, as I say, but it's what they do with that opinion afterwards that concerns me. And, and when they get into public roles, hold, you know, they become the bureaucracy and then they start influencing decisions that are made that you and I then as taxpayers have to pay for. That, that's where it concerns me. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure. I don't know. I've I'm probably always been this, had this sort of blind faith in... in in that things not getting too out of hand. When I hear stuff like that, I mean, things are out of hand, but they're not out of hand because of that kind of thinking. That kind of thinking is a pro, is, is coming from things being out of hand. And in my, in my opinion, out of hand means what, you know, at the moment, what, what I'm referring to is, is out of hand is that the system that got us here needs adjustment. Mm-hmm. It's not serving us to go further, it's actually sort of hit its... It seems to have hit a kind of point where it's not... It's becoming more of a hindrance than a help. And I'm, and I'm not talking about democracy. I'm just talking about capitalism. I'm talking about the fact that, you know, the world, the rich... You know, this whole... Uh, where the money, the control of the money is getting into such, such few hands, um, you know, and... All these things seem to be getting compromised around us, and we kind of go. And I think it's it's reasonable that the world is kind of looking at it and going, "How can we redesign this?" And there's there's plenty of uh, plenty of voices out there talking about redesigning all sorts of things. I was reading about this thing called the other day called Modern Monetary Theory, which talks about uh, any country that has its own currency can just can just pump can just print money, pump it into its economy hmm. and change things for the better all over the place. Our government would never, ever think about that because they're thinking in a, in, of an economic model that was created mid-last century and was seemingly right for some period of time, but it's actually not necessarily right. Hmm. And, and um, this, you know, protecting of the, of, the, of the deficit and, you know, the surplus and all that stuff, it's just, it's just noise, just political noise. It doesn't hmm. mean anything to anybody. When you look at Japan and how much debt they're in, and I mean, I'll just start to read an article because I need, but they, <laughs> they, they've been flying along. They're rich as, they're rich as all fuck from a, on a household point of view. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, they've, got, they've been running deficits for decades. Mm. And, uh, you know, all of this stuff, we're, just, we're stuck in a set of rules that have been set up post-war to World War II, worked for a long time seemingly, um, but, you know, maybe it's time for a readjustment. And that's all, this whole thing is about the world understanding that, I think. That's what I think. I don't know who's going to be able to do it. I just hope the next generation of voters gets in fast, fast. And um, some people can kind of present themselves who are going to be capable of doing it. Mm. Yeah, well said, mate. Yeah, I don't tend to agree with you on that one there. I don't. I, I have more, far more questions than answers at the time, and I think anybody that has the answers, as a lot of these young socialists would like to think that they have, mate, isn't asking the right questions a lot of the time. I agree with you about what you're saying about the, uh, the, uh, the model that has been implemented by governments the world over, the globalisation effort, if you like, uh, since World War II and the like, which really, in, in our case, uh, OK, there's a lot, of, lot more detail, a hell of a lot more detail this than I have time to go into, but from the perspective that, you know, the whole idea that you get locked into a fairly shitty job, you get your mortgage, you send your kids through a 
low-level private school or what have you, then you go and buy a Mazda 6 or a Mazda 5 or whatever yeah. the hell it is, and it locks you into a household outgoing of 120 grand a year, and both parents need to work their 100 grand a year jobs in order to keep the family sort of ticking, mate. That's no wonder bloody, you know, pharmaceutical companies are fighting against the use of CBD oils and stuff because they've got a truckload of money to make on bullshit pharmaceutical antidepressants and, and things that sort of keep people locked into their banal existences. And I think that's that's an existential question. That's almost a spiritual question, that one there, about what are we here for? Because I, my own take on it is we're bloody well not here to do that. And I don't do it. I'm, as I mentioned, I'm back at uni, mate. I'm reframing and and um, getting reskilled after many years at Telstra. And I, I worked with a lot of people, mate. And the other thing is that just their health is rotten too. You know, yeah. their, their weight's ballooning and all the rest of it. And I just look at them and I think, fuck, man. Just look after yourself and, you know, who cares that you've got a Tesla or whatever? Yeah, yeah. You know, like, I, yeah. I think Teslas are cool too. I think they're cool as shit, but I don't think they're worth dying over or risking your health over to keep yourself in a job that you hate, working with people that you hate even more. Um, mm. <laughs> so, so the broad, broad conversation, brother, and I want to thank you for going there with me. With it. You've been listening to the Scars and Guitars podcast series that syndicates for the A-List Online, and my name is Andrew Mackay-Smith. That interview subject was Cam McKenzie from the Melbourne-based outfit, Horsehead. Thanks so much for listening.